to check that out. Mine's in a terrible state, man. You're on. You're on, man. Okay. Yeah. So we are live. Uh, again, excuse the delay. Um, same thing last week. Facebook and Zoom were not talking well together. Anyway. We are live for our Q&A and Ask Me Anything with Gary Lever Sensei. So, Gary was born in London, England. He's been practicing karate, Gojiru, uh, since 1991. He continues to study uh, Gojiru karate under the guidance of Keo Ong, since, Keo Ong Sensei since 2012. He has written four books on Goju Real Karate, and he continues to conduct research and further his understanding of the art, training under such notable teachers as Hokama Tetsuro Sensei, Yasuda Tetsunuka Sensei, Kinju Sekichi Sensei, and many others. And I personally met Gary uh, a number of years ago at Sifu Paul Ritwad's um, school, and we trained together there. And then that's when I understood that he'd been doing, he, he trained karate as well as Southern Praying Mantis. And that piqued my interest. And we became close friends since then. And we've, we've spoken and we've trained together. And I've gone personally to his gym and trained and I love it. So Gary currently teaches a small group of dedicated students at his, uh, his, at his dojo where he endeavors to preserve the spirit and the ancient training methods of, of, of classical karate. So Gary, Thank you for joining myself and Alex, and thank you for, for taking the time to share with the Southern Praying Mantis group. Um, as you know, uh, between the two of us, we're, we're trying to help the community during this kind of coronavirus pandemic. So setting up training sessions, daily training sessions, and setting up talks with people such as yourselves in a way to keep people engaged and keep them busy during this time. So thank you for joining. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, so the setup is this. We go live on Facebook. Um, people from the group ask questions. Alex and myself will try to, to capture them as capture as many as possible. Uh, we've already taken some questions from the group earlier on. So Alex and I are going to fire these questions at you um, and then you answer them however you, however you, uh, however you want. Uh, before we go into that, it would be great to learn a little bit about you, your, your karate, your teachers, and your lineage, and anything else uh, that will provide context to the rest of this, rest of this talk, and of course, um, uh, how it fits in with uh, Southern Praying Mantis. Hmm. Okay, so I, I started training, you know, my, like most of us of our generation as a kid, interested in the Karate Kid movies, the Ninja Turtles, the Van Damme movies, it was kind of like a cool era and that piqued my interest. So I got into martial arts because a lot of my friends were doing it and went down the, the karate route because that's, that's all we had in the town at that time. Um, but it kind of became the only thing I was ever good at. I was never any really good at football or swimming or any sports really, but martial arts kind of, I, I found my place where I fit. Um, so I continued and then as I, as I started leaving school, I was reading a lot more about history. My interest peaked about Okinawa and, you know, I, I had in my, my heart the desire to go there to learn more about it, um, which led me to switching styles. So as a kid, I trained in Kyokushin Kai, which is a very Japanese style, you know, very hard, very big movements, um, but quite far removed from its Okinawan roots, the more now I read. So I tried to go back more towards the original way that karate was being done with a, with a view of going to Okinawa and training. So eventually I came to practice the Goju-Ru school. Um, and then I traveled out to Okinawa at the age of 19, 20. Um, trained out there, you know, made multiple visits over the years. Um, and then you know, that's basically brings me to here. On my travels in Okinawa, I started finding out more and more about the Chinese roots of the art. Um, how it kind of goes through in particular. The, the, the common theory is it traces its roots back to the White Crane. So I started researching the White Crane and it didn't quite fit for me. You know, it did, I didn't quite see the link. I didn't quite get the match. And just, just to confirm that, that would be the Southern White Crane of Kung Fu. Southern right? White Crane, correct. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So specifically Yongchun White Crane. So, you know, we'll go more into this about the Bubishi and things like that. But Goju Ru traces its lineage to Southern White Crane in the oral history, at least. 
So I started researching that and the, the pieces didn't quite fit. There was a lot that wasn't quite adding up in the history that's been handed down. Um, so then eventually I started looking into to other Southern arts, you know, specifically the Southern Mantis, the Back May, the Five Ancestor Fist. And I started seeing a lot more common ground within those, specifically the Chow Gar. Um, and then how I come to train with, with, with Sifu Whitrod and you guys was basically, I had no training partners, you know, for, for real. You know, I, I was traveling to Okinawa a lot and I've, I've, I've never quite fit within the Gojiru circle in the UK. I just haven't. So I've never had any Sorry, training partners. Why is that, Gary? Um, <laughs> because I've got a big mouth. <laughs> I, I, I didn't know about this, but you say it, and then the question piques my curiosity as to, okay, maybe we should come back to that one, but please carry on. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I, I, to make a long story short, I had no dojo here. I had no training partners or anything like that. Um, my teacher at the time lived in Spain, so I would travel over there a couple of times a year to train with him. But as with regards to an actual school where I was training at regularly, there was nothing over here for me. Um, so the closest thing to it was the Chow Gar Madness. You know, you guys had very similar drills to us, you had very similar forms to us, very similar training mindset to us. And, and I found out when I went to train with Sifu Whitrod, I didn't feel like I was practicing Madness. I was just practicing Goju Ru, you know? And, um, it's quite interesting. So, yeah. 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 You know, you know, cause I, I, the things we, you know, we do the push hands, we do the, the arm banging, um, the techniques are very similar. The overall strategy of the forms is very similar. It just fit, you know, in a way that other Chinese hearts hadn't with me up until that time. Um, and yeah, and that, that brings us up to today. I eventually opened my own school over here, a um, full-time dojo in Brentwood, Essex. That ran for a couple of years and then, you know, that, that, that basically died of death last year. Um, and then since that time, that's it. It's just me now. Are you, are you, um, are you teaching a small group? At the moment. No, 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 not not no, not, not since um, September. So now I teach my kids group, right? Um, and I have one or two adult students um, who you know we, they come and visit maybe once a month, something like that. But with regards to a, 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 an actual school and a regular training schedule, no, not anymore. But um, but leading on from that, you you went into what's now known as the PT farm, where hmm. you where you teach strength and conditioning and uh, practice health and fitness, um, which is another reason that I wanted to speak, wanted you to speak to this group as well, because um, I think it's really important to talk about, to see the, because you've come from a very classical, ancient training methods of training, where I remember when I came to train with you, we were using the Kongu Ken, we were using the heavy jars, mm. we are using the, the stone, the stone blocks, mm. uh, and other training methods, and then, uh, uh, then you're also um, well adept in other strength and training methods. So I really want to see the link between the two and, 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 and also just talk about modern stuff like, okay, uh, just layman's terms, what's good nutrition? What's mm. good strength and conditioning? What are, mm. are things that we should be doing that don't um, impact the art? Because I guess mm. a lot of traditional way of thinking is no you shouldn't push weight you shouldn't do this it makes you like this it makes you like that it stops your gang so if there is anything you can talk about that later that would be fantastic and i'll bring that yeah, up as a question anyway definitely. so um thank you for that um so we have a number of questions alex will kick off with a couple i'll kick off with a couple and uh, as questions come in from the group on the live um we'll we'll kind of just keep going um but then if anything comes up or you want to just talk about stuff please just go with it cool okay hi gary welcome hi, thanks Alex. for being here uh it's, i think it's gonna be an interesting one because uh, uh i've got a great interest in that i've seen a bit of gojiru and i've seen where it can seem to overlap and there's similarities um you've kind of touched on um I think the, uh, the the first question that I had, which was, uh, what was your interest in Chalgar? Did you did you see similarities? And obviously, you you did research on YouTube and whatever to see how did you come into contact with Southern Primantis? So with with the Southern Mantis, my my interest was first peaked with the the mind body kick ass thing with Chris right. Kudeli, right? Exactly. You know, to see yeah. you know seeing Grandmaster and and you know the, what he was capable of and just that 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 shock power 
it was it was unlike anything I'd seen before. The way they did the sandbodge in, it, it was I was like, wow, you know, because there, there's an old poem in Okinawan martial arts concerning Sanchin. Yeah, where it, it says, "Grasping the first bolt of lightning with the empty hands," because it used to be, you know, they, they, it was written by a newspaper reporter back in the early 1900s, where he saw the students practicing Sanchin. He said it looked like they'd been struck by lightning because they were like they had that that movement to that shock element. Yeah. And you don't see that now, you know, maybe to an extent with a way to root, but certainly not in Goju root. So when I first saw um, the San Bojun of the Southern Mantis, I was like, wow, that's it. That's what they were talking about. Interesting. You know? So yes. that's what, what first piqued my interest. Um, so then I, I actually started studying with Sifu Whitrod, the, the Ditta methods. Right. Um, you know, that, and that's how I first came to that school was studying the medicine and the massage. Um, and then to make a very long story short, my, my teacher, Kayo, who, who we'll get onto in a, in a bit, yeah. he, he studied a lot of Southern Mantis, um, the Jukulum system. Right. And he, he told me, if you want to learn the short range power of Goju Guru, you need to study the Mantis. He said that, and that will unlock it for well, you. But to unlock it, to open it up for you, they to unlock it. Yeah, it's already it's, there, but this was a way of uh, yeah finding it. Yeah, you know, not not only is it already there, it's an essential component. And if it's if it's lacking that component or lacking that attribute, it don't work. Yeah, yeah, you I know? understand that. Yeah, some of the techniques you can be shown, but if you haven't got the fundamental engine behind it, yeah, then you know it's it's hard to make it work. It, yeah, and it's intended. Yeah, um, just going back a bit, Ko, did he did he study juglam in America? Mm. Right, so it's American juglam. Yeah. American juglam. So within New York Chinatown. So he he lives in Chinatown. Yeah, um, and he studied, to, to my knowledge, um, within the school of um, Mr. Lam Sang, you know, Monkey Sang. Yeah. Um, he was never a student of him as such, from my understanding, but he was a student within that school. Yeah, uh, during the early '60s, so it was quite a cool period to be learning it. Mm. There's a Freemasons Hall. That's right. It was being taught. Yeah, yeah, okay. that's right. Um, again, we've kind of covered it. You were. It was like a, my, my next question was: were you, were you searching for answer, answers to to questions that you had about Gojuru? Mm. Um, and if so, what did you find? Yeah, you know. It, uh, I, I was always searching that nothing ever made sense to me. You, you know, it, it, it's such a, it's, it's hard to describe. It, it, a lot of my friends within the Chinese arts call it Goju Ru. Even Kao calls it a chop suey system, where it's literally a mishmash of a lot of different ideas. It was an incomplete system. So, it, you know, Miyagi Chojin, the founder of the system, died before it was ever completed. Right. And he was always modifying it and always adapting and changing things. Mm. Um, but because of the whole situation with World War II and Okinawa and the amount of destruction that was caused, what's actually been handed down to these times is so fragmented and so, um, you know, there's a lot of internal politics between the different students and no one can agree on anything. It's very similar to, yeah, to Manus yeah, in some ways. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it, people think, oh, after a generation or so, um, the next generation it will be slightly different and watered down or, or, or just change but that can happen that and i've seen it happen. within generations we've been yep. close training partners will have a different um idea about what the system means to them and they, they bring out what what it means to them so the flavor is very different as long as the the essence is there then it's you know it's all um, it's all pucker, but it, it needs you know people need to have that deep understanding of the essence, and once they've got that, they can virtually do what they want with it. Mm. If that remains, then then whatever they do has got that foundation behind it, you know. So it's easy to see how at, at the top levels, or people can change stuff, um, but but when it drifts away too far, if you haven't got the the links. You know, what did they study to get to where they are and what they're doing? If, if those are lost, if those training methods have changed it, but they've lost the original, then, then it does be, seem to become very fragmented, you know. And I, I think, think so. Yeah. You, you know, and, and, and the proof was in the pudding. When I, when I was visiting Chinese schools, um, you know, I can, I can remember, I don't know if you guys remember the Shaolin Way store down in um, Chinatown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, since yeah. you got long. 
Yeah. I can remember going there a number of times and getting absolutely just whooped by him. Right. Uh, oh, like friendly stuff. But, you know, I realised yeah. I had no essence. There was no heavy hairs. There was no conditioning. Yeah. I yeah. had nothing. I trained a long time. I was relatively well established within the Goju community. But there was no essence. There was no... There was no attributes to my art. It just looked good. It was a gun with no yeah. bullets, you know. That's, that's quite interesting. I think that leads on. Sorry, Nish, do you want to jump in? Or, or there, is, there is one question which links with this, um, which was uh, um, re, re, referring to the Heigung. Um, oh, where is it? We can, <coughs> we, can come, we can come back to that one. Well, we can come back to it, yeah. Yeah, so, All right. Gary, just taking a step back um for those that might not know the difference and uh, forgive me not even i do not all karate is the same right so could you just briefly explain what's unique about okinawan or uh, goju in comparison to other styles of karate and then going on from that just a little bit about your teachers and the lineage and and how that all fits together mm, okay so with so karate comes from Okinawa. So where we're at now, it's fragmented into however many hundreds of thousands of schools, right? Take that back, it goes to Japan. Take that back further, the original birthplace of karate is Okinawa. Yep. Now within Okinawa, you had maybe three main branches of the art. You had Shurite, which was based around the, the, the royal capital of Okinawa at the time. That was more influenced maybe, maybe by native fighting elements, maybe a little bit of Japanese mainland, a little bit of Northern Chinese elements. You had the Tamari Te. Tamari Te was like the, the equivalent of the dockyards, where it would be quite eclectic there. You, you'd get kind of like quite a random collection of techniques from there. And then you had the Naha Te. And Naha Te was kind of like for want of a better word, the more Chinese settlements. You had a lot of a lot of Chinese envoys coming over from southern China, establishing roofs within Okinawa, and you actually had a Chinatown established there. So the Goju Ru comes from the Chinatown, which was a village called Kumimura. Now, the arts that were introduced into Kumimura, nobody knows, you know, but oral testimony has it goes all the way back to the 1300s that the Chinese arts were being drip fed to this area. And there were martial arts groups who would meet up. I went to these, the same place they used to train, you know, to go, to go train and, you know, get on the ground and feel the atmosphere. Um, but nobody knows what it was. It's like, is it White Crane? Is it, who the hell knows? But at the end of the day, I think all you can look at is Chinatowns all around the world. Now, you guys probably been told the same thing as me. The real Kung Fu no longer lives in China. It's found within the Chinatowns dotted around the world. Because come the Cultural Revolution or the Boxer Rebellion or whatever, you know, the, 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 the real teachers of their Sword, they were persecuted and they had, to, they had to flee the land. So then they settled within the Chinatowns and then they established schools there. But same thing was happening in Okinawa. You'd have the, the Chinese bandits, you'd have the pirates, you'd have all these vagabonds finding their ways onto Okinawan shores. And then they get a local reputation and young little, you know, 17 year old Okinawan kid used to lifting rocks and punching wood. He's like, man, I want to learn the Chinese arts, you know? So that kind of became the roots of Goju Ru. All we know for sure is it had its roots within the Southern Shaolin systems based primarily around the Sanchin frame framework. From that, it's been added to, subtracted from tinkered with over time until what we've ended up with now is this kind of chop suey system but a short sharp method of learning some quite good skills kind of like an overview of the southern chinese arts in general um is um is gojiru um practice where, wherever it's practice is it all very similar or is it all that's a good question. Very different wherever you go. No, it, 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 can, it can vary wildly, even, even within Okinawa and Goju Ru, like legitimate schools. Yeah. Um, Miyagi Chojin, the founder of the system, taught differently depending on A, the time, the, the time frame. So he taught very differently pre World War II compared to post World War II. He also taught very differently amongst his students. So he would talk, teach them according to 
um, body type or temperament or you know attributes maybe they're clumsy they can't learn the intricacies very interesting um, and then the other thing with that he wouldn't teach he never taught anybody the whole system you know someone in in, in Okinawa you'd get maybe two three forms at the most so every student only learned two or three forms. So then when Miyagi passed, they got together and then they started exchanging, right, I know this form, you know that one, let's teach each other. You know, so even then, and then you add that further down the line and it, it becomes some, some real weird varieties. So is there an official, and excuse me, I don't know, is there an official Goja Real association where all of these all of these elements have come together and you now have a formalized system that no no okay. I, I don't i don't think that would ever happen and I, I you know what i that's that's actually a quite a good question because I, I think in a sense it's organically starting to happen um because the the essence is being lost as it's coming further downstream all the all the schools are starting to look more and more similar mm. whereas if you go back a generation you could tell by looking at a form, oh, that's Taguchi's or oh, that's Miyazaki's. You could tell just yeah. from the camera. Now, it's, everything's starting to look a little bit the same, which is what I often talk about and why I'm not particularly popular because I think I, I don't think the art's got anything left now, you know, um, on, on the whole. Um, carry on for them. So, having spoken to you and trained with you, your particular lineage, and I'll say your lineage of goju you have a unique set of warm-up exercises the tyson uh, uh the rumor tyson the rumor um mm. so we had a question from uh -huh, yeah we had a question from jonathan kearney saying and steve actually steve was like steve, yeah steve steve hayes you know steve hayes very well yeah, he said yeah. he was saying okay how important is tyson the rumor to your training and development in general and john was like i'd like to learn more about this Tyson Daruma, how it's come about, is it unique to your lineage? And a little bit about, could you talk about that particular yeah, set? Yeah, definitely. So the Tyson Daruma, Miyagi Chojin formulated a, a warm up sequence or a set of body calisthenics and general prep work. He formulated that, Miyagi Chojin, the founder of the system. So it starts at the toes, and there's a general localization, activation of all different muscle groups, all the joints. And what you're basically doing is a, an all over body scan to look for deficiencies or over or under development in area, any areas. Through doing that process, you would then highlight where you're deficient and you could then address that deficiency through use of the resistance equipment, the, you know, the old fashioned stuff we did, you know, the Chishi strength stone, the Nagiri Gami or, or lifting jars, the Congo Ken. So if you had a deficiency, perhaps, you know, you, you, had, you, you couldn't lock in your punch all right, pick up the chishi. You had weak shoulders, okay, let's do sashi. Your grip was no good, okay, let's lift the jars. You know, it was never as such to develop, to develop attributes, it was more to fix problems you had. So then the, the Jumbian though, it would also include a set of floor calisthenics, you know, various push-up variations, sit-ups, a lot of mule kicks, you know, stuff that's still popular now within the calisthenics world. Um, and then one of Miyagi Chojin's students, who I trace my lineage through, is a person called Taguchi. Now Taguchi got heavily into yoga. So he added to it a lot of different stretches. He was you know, encouraged apparently by Miyagi to add this stuff to it. So a lot of our stretch work and our groundwork, which is very similar to the, um, the dragon legs form of you guys, we have a whole, a whole ground sequence, which is almost identical, um, all came via Taguchi. Uh, but as to importance, it is, put it this way, it's, it's like, I would, I, would put, I would compare it to having um, like Windows or iOS or something on your computer. I'm not very techy, but I'm going to try and put this analogy out. So if you're working in like DOS, you know, where you have to input everything on your computer, it's like proper hard. You won't be able to do it. Yeah. The layman. But if you had Windows, you'd know to just click and everything just runs in the background quite simply. That's the task of the room and that's the Jumbiundo. It teaches you the framework. It teaches you where the joints are supposed to be. It teaches you the, the body structure, the all guns forward, how to lock in, how to release, how to generate power. Basically, how to perform the forms before you even do the forms. 
so that by the time you come to learn the system, your body's already prepped, it's already moving right. You don't have to learn it as such. It's like what Seafood Paul said about in his interview last week. Once you kind of like get the, the engine, it's just a case of learning sequence. You know, it's quite easy then. The hard work is actually getting yeah. that foundation laid. And that's the what Tarsal the Room is for. Yeah. And does 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 the Tyson Daruma link very closely with with San Chin? Now I ask this because it's very interesting what you said about the the Tyson Daruma being able to scan and find weaknesses and then use the traditional training methods to strengthen. And I think that's fantastic. So I definitely have to relearn that with you. I'm I'm not going to lie, I've forgotten it, but it's made me pique my interest again. Um, because I use personally, I use Sambo Jin as this um, this doorway to feel: am I am I moving as one unit? Where do I feel that weakness? It's probably not as it's just Sambo Jin; it changes. But mm. does does the San Chin relate closely to the the Tyson in terms of that scanning, or is it completely separate? No, it's it's it's, it's the same. You know, the the, the San Chin is is what the Goju system runs on. So you could say that the Tyson the rumor. <coughs> informs the sanchin and the sanchin informs the fighting forms wow yeah you know so it, it, it is it is kind of that layering system and it always comes back in the end it's, all, it's more like a circle i guess so you would do the task of the rumor into your sanchin put that into your fighting forms and then you just keep going around that same loop and building and building upon layers much like um, we say about samba jin that all the training whatever you it was see for paul said it uh, last week, as well. whatever you learn, whatever you develop, it, it feeds back into summer gin. So you do dip grab gong, you find out it's in summer gin, and then you can utilize it more. You know, yeah. so it's, it's that circular thing of, of development, it's continuous development. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was explained yeah. to me once by yeah. one of my teachers. It's, it's, it's like you feel like you're going in circles, coming back to the same point, but you're actually going up a spiral staircase. Yes, oh, even I like though that. you're going in a circle, right. it's getting up and up yeah. and up. You know. I've seen the same description that you're walking along a pathway and people think they're not getting very far or they're, you know, they're, they're just not achieving. It's not until you look back that you see you're actually, you're, you're right. how high you've gone, you've walked up the path, you're not anywhere near where you were. It seems like the same path, but it's, um, you've yeah. moved on, you know? Yeah. And that's, that's an important lesson, actually, for people doing traditional arts, because it can seem really tedious and boring and repetitious uh, and, and people if they're training with people that are senior to them can't see their development because they don't feel stronger than the other person because they're always yeah one step ahead of them <laughs> it's not until they touch hands with someone else or or you know ex experience other people that they realize actually what they have achieved so it is yeah. an important lesson that one yeah fantastic um so <laughs> another question how do the Okinawan methods compare to the Chinese methods? And this can be any Chinese method. It doesn't have to be specific to Southern Mantis, and I'm sure there are similarities. So solo draining drills, uh, equipment, partner drills. I, I, you know, a lot of, I think all of our two-man two stuff, you know, whether it's the limb knocking, whether it's the push hands, you know, shin grinding, all that stuff. You, you can find similarities in China, even within Thailand. But I think there's only so many ways to move the body and you're going to find overlaps. I don't yeah. care where you, whether it's India or, or, or even MMA, you're going to find overlaps everywhere, you know. Um, China, the Chinese martial arts are so, such a vast, it's such a vast subject. So to even pin that down, you're going to find it everywhere. You know, even in Shuai Jiao, you're going to find the same throws we have. You, the Okinawans were adept at stealing. There's no, no two ways about it. They, that's, they're known for their champuru culture. Now, what champuru means is grabbing any old thing, chucking it in a wok and cooking it, man, and yeah. making something good out of it. And that's what the Okinawans did with all their culture. So it's heavily influenced by China. It's heavily influenced by Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, India. Even Europe, you've got, you got Portuguese stick fighting methods. You've got, yeah, fantastic. You know, Everything's Jow, in there, Jow, Jow de Pao or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Even, uh, like, even, I mean, I don't know the, the legitimacy of this claim, but they even claim Morris Dancing is found in Okinawa and influenced the stick fighting methods. Interesting. Oh, for yeah, real, that is a real interesting one because 
I've heard a lot about like Morris Dancing have martial kind of application. Mm. And you can see it, you know, there's stick fighting basically, but it's just seen as a dance nowadays or whatever. But uh, yeah, but it's, you know, Okinawa is the same thing. The the the, the, the bow bow jitsu, what we call the star fighting. You have what's called mura bow, which is village village bow. Basically, any any big occasion, the villagers get together and they bash sticks together. It's Morris Dancing, which yeah, is yeah, yeah. That's that quite interesting. <laughs> so following on from that, regarding San Chin, can you talk a little bit about San Chin, just in general in terms of what it is, why it's important, and how it fits into Goju, and then we can talk about the similarities and differences between that and Sanbo Jin, because even the meaning of San Chin would be, would be fantastic from you. Mm. So, 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 so the meaning of San Chin means free conflicts or free battles what those three conflicts are it depends who you talk to you know again there's no consensus over to what that means the generally accepted one is that it's the mind body and the spirit and how to use that form to unify those three which are perhaps in conflict but in theory should not be and working in you know conjunction now with regards to its importance that it, the, the whole Goju system is built on that framework of guns facing forward, advancing movements, you know, very little retreat, and of a close range system, which relies on, you know, a framework in order to build strength within structure, you know, how to cover the gates, how to have a primary defense and a secondary defense, which is something that in the Goju they never talk about, but in the Manis is critical, yeah. about the elbows in. Yeah. So in the Goju room, you're instructed make this position, but you're not told why. For the, for the most part. Yeah. You know, and it wasn't until I started training with you know uh, with my teacher Kayo, um, and you know with you guys within the Summit Mantis, it was like, no, this is primary block, this is secondary block. If they breach your first defense, you need a second or a third within it's your. Also, yeah, structural as well. But that you've got that in Goju room because there is a massive emph emphasis on on that shape, isn't there? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, um, and yeah, and then, and then basically the, uh, more about the power generation. Now, here's here's what's strange about the Okinawan Sanchin though, with the Sanbojin and majority of the Chinese versions of Sanchin, everything's symmetrical or double-handed. Within the Goju Ru, it's more akin to a sword than a shield. So one hand will will maintain defense or position while the other hand can then go to work with the attack, which is, there are some Chinese arts that do that within their sanction, but on the whole, generally it's two-handed uh, symmetrical methods like the Sambo Jin. Um, and again, it's an area within Goju Ru that's not, not been explored to its full potential by a majority of practitioners, because the intention is put upon the punching hand, but the intention is lost on that hand. As soon as you lose that, you lose your frame, you lose your bridge, and then that's worthless anyway. So that's kind of like you yeah, need we, both. We had that kind of exploration in uh, in second form UQ mm. punch with just one hand at a time instead of the double hand. So mm. It's kind of there, and it's there's many layers to it as well. Mm. Uh, but I can remember when I first started, and I, I, would, I would step forward and punch, and then I was like, and it, and I would lose that hand. <laughs> so, so it's like trying to keep your shape and trying to remember and trying to keep the focus everywhere. Yeah. At the same time. Yeah. yeah. But it's, it's, I, I, it's, I, it's fascinating to see um, San Chin uh, and the Hakka arts side by side. There was a video some time ago, I think it was on YouTube, and you see San Chin. Yeah, the San Chin. Yeah. You see uh, five ancestors and you see white crane and then they start and they all go through together and then i was thinking okay let me imagine sambo jin next to it and the similarities were were fantastic and wonderful yeah. and they all and as you said you will have this kind of haka beggar's mm. hand open mm. hand starting from here you know mm. and start from the heart hand you know hands bridge techniques so mm. that is a that's amazing that you you can't look at that and think to yourself how are they not connected how is there not something there mm. Mm. absolutely you Obviously. know I, I was i was actually there for that i was there when that happened no really? way yeah I, I, I trained with those guys they're, they're the young Shin white crane guys yeah so yeah excellent i, I, I trained yeah. with them that, that 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 um that weekend it was quite cool 
That's, oh, a, wow. that was, that's gr a great thing for, to happen as well when you get masters of different systems sharing like that and comparing, that not mm. for any other purpose other than um, you know research development or whatever or comparison of the system. Yeah. So because there's links there, there's a niche shared. It's um, definitely we've, we've all it was really cool questions. actually. Uh, there, there was a, uh, an Okinawan teacher called uh, Mr. Gushi who John Kearney will know him. Yeah. Um, Shinyu Gushi, he is a Waichiru guy. And he was maybe in his seventies at a time, and you know we were stood next to each other learning the white crane sanchin from these visiting Chinese. You know it was a really cool, a really cool afternoon. And did you um did you kind of glean anything from that? Or well, you said before that you, you just didn't click with the white it, crane sanchin. It didn't. You, you know the the white crane. I I think it's way too rude. You know when, when I studied the Yongchun white crane specifically, the overlaps are. It, it seems a lot more akin to Weichiru than it did to Gojiru for me personally. Yeah, interesting. That's we've interesting. got a we've got a question just coming. There are some questions coming in on Facebook, but I I do want to interact with the with the group. So we've got a, a question from Lin uh, Jihu. He says, mm -hmm. "Gal, were you touching on Karamidi earlier? I'm guessing it's there, Karamidi in Chowgar. Mm -hmm. Can you? I actually don't know what Karamidi is, but if you could explain that, that would be." So, Karamidi, if, if I'm if I'm right, if my memory is right, it's, it's more entangling hands. So um, more controlling, sticking, more kumna type. type got you. Um, a lot of uh, weapons disarms, Kar Karamidi and stuff. Um, it's it's a strange one. This this that term, Lynn, If I'm getting this wrong, jump on, mate, because I'm doing this from memory. But this term first appeared for me in a, in a magazine like back in the like the nineties or something. Attributed to a specific. He says you're, he says you're spot, you're spot on. That's the one. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I have so many yeah. different hats I have to wear. Sometimes I get things wrong. Um, but yeah, Karamidi entangling hands. Now, within so Lynn, for you specifically, within your your sepai, there's a lot of Karamidi within your sepai. So for, for those who don't know, within the mantis, we have a form called sepai, which is 18 hands or 18 techniques. Supa. So, yeah, yeah, something like that. Okay, so yeah. you see, even like the, the pronunciation, everything was kind of what I remember the first time I learned Supa and Supa again. Yeah. We have a form called Supa Limpe. Mad. All right, which means, yeah. that's what it means. Yeah, I know the name, I didn't know what it meant. <laughs> that says 108. It's, a, yeah. it's, it's meant to mean 108, but the, the characters don't, it, it's like, again, it's like it's one of the things that don't make no sense. Yeah. So I learned Supa and Gen, it's like, well, that sounds pretty weird, and it's a lot like Tensho, it's kind of. Oh, that's, that's weird. And the amount, you know, 18, 36, 13, these same numbers appear within all the Southern Shaolin systems. Mm. And I think if, if ever there was a way of tracing the DNA of these arts, you'd find the same route, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I think there's more similarities, as I said to someone today, there's more similarities in, in a lot of these styles than, than the differences, you know, the there is a definite overlap, you know, mm. it might be different methodology or whatever, or some bits may be absent from some systems, but there's, there's a, this, this link tenuous sometimes, but there is a link that I think, oh, we, I think we, it, we could trace back to. A I think I, I didn't know that. And that's wonderful to, mm. to hear. Just staying on with the, the sun chin, if you don't mind, Gary. So when, when, you look at Sambo Jin or when, when you see us train or when you do it yourself, what are some of the sort of differences or similarities that you're seeing between San Chin and Sambo Jin? And I'll give you an example. Whenever I'm, I'm teaching or even when I'm doing Sambo Jin, some of the things I focus on grip, gripping up, like imagine crashing a pebble between my buttocks, uh, opening and closing of the ribs, uh, the float, spit, sink, swallow concepts of manis and then gripping and then grip release and all of these things to develop internally as well as kind of build and use that sambo jin as a framework to understand where i am in the system or if i feel something doesn't feel quite right how do i fix that with that in mind can you allude to kind of san chin and how it fits in with mm. with that mm. so san chin first thing you know as you as you come to jumbei it's and sorry, process. sorry, 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 guy. Is Sanchin stressed on as important as we have on Sambo? Are we like Sambo Jin, Sambo Jin, Sambo? 
Ah, cool. Should be, should be. I know schools don't do it. I know schools do it infrequently, once every three months. Sanchin, if there's no Sanchin, there's no Goji Roo. It's as simple as that. You know, mm. and if if your Sanchin is no good, you might as well not bother with the rest of the system because that's all gonna suck as well. And that's you know, uh, uh, Sifu Ipju Kang always says he goes, "I look at your Sambo Jin, I know, I know what level you are, I know where you are, I know your level. I have to look at your Sambo Jin, I know." And you know, that's one who he has to look at. It's funny when when you know when I train with Kayo, the amount of times he'll come to Jumbei and he'll just he'll he'll slam the no oh, again. Because it's just like, it's not firing. It's not, it's not engaged. The, the intent's not there. The engagement's not there. That's just coming to Jumbei. So like you guys would wash down, we, we, when we come to Jumbei, it's here, and then open out, and then to here. And during that time, so as you're, as you're opening out, then you come into the ribs, you start to engage the delts, you start, start to sink your root, you start to sink, you start to chun. Then as we open out, we're floating, and then sinking, and then as you draw it in, the whole time the, the, the system's pressured. You have that internal gas. Yeah. And that's what you're trying to get the whole time. So it should feel like a, a, a well inflated ball. It should never be slack and loose. So all the time there's that feeling of repelling, of warding off from all directions. It's very omnidirectional, even though the intention is of going forward, in the same time, it's all around. Yeah. And sinking down six feet below the ground, but connecting upwards at the same time. The overlaps are vast. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's in, definitely um, <laughs> it's, it's it's mind-boggling. Actually, some of it, you know. Um, in terms of in terms of um, Gudru and and the San Chin, do do you or is it regarded as um, as Hei Gung? It, it, development, or is it, um, people focus mainly on the, the muscular external feel of it? I think it, I think it would depend on. Here's what I found on the web. <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's that up as well. <laughs> Let Alexa tell us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, exactly, Alexa knows the answer. <laughs> With the, I think it would depend on which school you went to and the experience of the practitioner. So obviously when you start, the focus is on the external, getting the right shape, and it's going to be very muscular driven. It's going to be quite brute, brute force style of San Chin. Mm -hmm. Over time, obviously it should be more and more refined so that more essence is revealed. It takes a lot less effort to create a much bigger effect. Um, now we have um, the Shimei. Now you guys also, I mean, see if you pull comes around and, and, and tests, you know, your sample gene as you do it. We have the same thing within the San Chin where you've probably seen the guy slamming the shoulders and that kind of thing. That in itself was just basically to test that the system was gas, that it was pressurized, that there was engagement in the right areas. And also to inject a little bit of essence from the teacher. So not to get too woo-woo or too mystical, it's like adding clay to the practitioner. So sometimes when you touch hands, there's almost that residual effect that you- Transmission. That's the a physical, transmission, right. Physical transmission. That's like, that when you feel someone that's so much stronger than you, that, that teaches you. You've, yes. You actually, it, it can raise your level just by feeling that, you know? I mean, the, 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 the development, as you say in the power is is the same i think um it was a question to see people and uh basically the stages of development from Cholgen to the the rough raw natural power that you everyone has to do we have it naturally but you have to develop that and get stronger yeah. until it starts to develop into um i'm getting the the hidden power and once it's hidden and you it's refined that way so you accumulate through the regular training then then it's refined and then you've got that power, the control in your body that it's now harder to read, it's hidden. Mm. But, and then you express it as you develop and build that, how you can then learn to express it in the, in the gang, mm. gang gang. So it's, um, it's stages of development, isn't it? So I, I should assume Sanchin is never the same. It's, it's a continual path of development as well. Um, and yeah. it feels different each time. Yeah, so, definitely. And, and, you know, it's one of those things where you feed off the people around you. Every time I come back from New York, my sanction feels different. It's just, 
it's very hard yeah. to put my finger on. It yeah. just feels different. Yeah, yeah. No, so we have a, a question that, that continues to follow on. So the flow is quite nice. So on breathing methods, Southern Praying Mantis uses nasal breathing with the tongue permanently up, while Goju Ryu uses nose inhale with the tongue up, mouth exhale with the tongue down, then up with the three accompanying locks. I'm, I'm pretty sure you, you know what this is, means. Can you talk about some insights, your personal experience, and perhaps how breath affects the eyes, glare, eagle shot, which I always go on about, in the mm. two methods? That's a long question. Did, have you got that? It's a, long, it's a long, I've read that one a few times. So okay. I, I, I kind of, um, I, know, I know what he's asking. With, a, a, a bugbear with mine in the Goju and the San Chin is, where, it's become very, how, the, how can I word this without pissing people off? <laughs> <laughs> Just say it. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's become very much for effects, right? For visual effects. So when, when you see people do the San Chin, They'll overly tense their body. When they inhale, there will be a bit of big show of really screwing up the face and everything. Then when they exhale, it means like this whole big, like a lion roar sort of thing. Mm. And I don't know when this took hold because as soon as you do that, you lose all your locks. You, you lose the ability to, to withstand on your neck. You lose the ability to armor up the temples. You, you just lose your connections. As soon as you start screwing your face up, you're losing the glare, you're losing the, 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 the nasal passage, you, you're restricting the airflow. So I don't know when this took hold. So when, when we do Sanchin within my lineage, you have the similar face to all the Southern schools where you have, what was it called the fish mouth, right? Like the, the drum, you know the beat of drum? Yeah. So you have the fish mouth. So as, as, you, as you make your posture, you buy it. Something that's never taught in the Goji room. They don't talk about bite in the teeth. We do. We have the same thing. You bite and it goes in there. In. And as you inhale, the tongue's on the roof of the mouth. And as you exhale, so even though you're exhaling from the mouth, the mouth remains the same shape. The teeth are still close together. Because as soon as you start opening the mouth, good night, baby. Yeah. And you've got to constantly like you said, you've got to constantly train those muscles, the jaw, the temple, everything around here and the neck. And that's all part of what we would call the, the gum gong, golden bell. But you're, yes. you're building up from the toes all the way up. So your training, your daily training or the training you do, it has to stay like that. You can't just have, suddenly be doing this because you're losing it. Mm. It's, 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 it's like, you know, with, with the sun chin, you... You're inflating a balloon, and what often happens is, you know, people inflate a balloon on the inhale, and then they'll completely deflate it on the exhale. So then there's no gas in the system, there's no oil. <laughs> so it's about, it's the same as the way you the same with a man, it's about releasing small parts at a time. So even though we might be exhaling for the whole time, you retain you're still it. retaining. Yeah. You're still armored up, yeah, you're yeah. still able to take a shot. Especially because if you think about what we're doing within a stanch in, this arm's got something. It's either blocking something or it's grabbing something or it's, or it's, or it's in a clinch, whatever it's going to do while this other arm's doing it. But to assume you're going to be able to do that without getting hit yourself at the same time is a little bit optimistic. Mm. So if you're completely losing your armor on your exhale, you have no Sanchin, you have no Goju Ru. So even though the two methods might look different, they might look dissimilar, the natural fact they're the same in application, in my opinion. You talked about armoring up the temples. Um, is there a specific thing that you do within that structure, within your facial expression that does that? I'm not very good at it. My teacher, if you see my teacher, his, his, his face changes. I, I don't have the statue in here, it's in my dojo. Mm. But you ever see the, the Buddhist deities? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it is when, he, when his arm is up, yeah, it comes this way. Yeah, the ears draw back, the mouth bites. The yeah. every, it, it's, you, 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 you need to see it. It's freaky. Yeah. Wow. Um, it's it is the same in summer gym that a lot of people don't do with in in women forms is to have that fierce expression and that intent in your eyes and to have the tongue up to have the the correct um, shape of the head back. 
and to have the, the pursing of the lips. I think it goes through, do you turn yours down? The corner of the mouth, is it turned down? Or Not really, most people go like that. <laughs> <laughs> because with us, it, it's supposed to, I was always told, purse the lips, so, so you pull back. That's that's chaos. That's how that yeah. happens. And that expression is what is what actually, hot, it, it does a lot of stuff energetically, but it's, it's what's actually starting to build the energy around the temples as well, mm. as I've been told. Anyway, so that, that expression is, and I probably don't do it enough, you know, but um, that's that's kind of part and parcel of that whole thing. So the way Nish was running the class and saying, don't be lazy, don't be lazy, press your toes, do this, clench your butt, all of that. And, and we can be lazy on our own and stuff. It's good to be um, reminded of it all the time and then to constantly test and remind yourself, you know. Mm-hmm. But it's yeah, I just find these little things are quite interesting that can easily be lost if we don't mm. um, stop being lazy. Basically. The, yeah. the, similar, the similarities as you're talking, they just become closer and closer. It's, yeah. it's, it's fascinating. Um, so uh, following up the question, I'm going to switch between them. So uh, how does your practice and teaching today differ versus your first years of of teaching and training very different yeah very different so when i when i started go drew i trained with, in a post world war 2 system the emphasis was very much on the hojuundo or the the weight equipment in the congo ken shishi this kind of thing um, so there was a lot of emphasis upon the strength building and and the, and the the development in that form training with Kao and his group he's quite outspoken against that approach it's not that he doesn't do it or hasn't done it it's that he thinks it's overdone and creates dead power which ties into what you were talking about earlier interesting um it can be overdone and i personally think that i overdid it because that was kind of my thing it was what I was kind of known for and popular for and stuff. So, you know, I went, I went to town with that. So the chishi, you know, I'd be able to hold it on the end, you know, with just the finger and thumb. I'd stand on one leg and do pistol squats while I was swinging it around and stuff. Damn. Yeah. It, it, so I, I went really off on the deep end on it, but it didn't, it didn't translate to actual ability. You know, I still had no essence. There was no heaviness. There was no, no, no touch. So training under KO is very different. There's, there's no weight training at all, really. It's the Tyson of the rumor. And his, his whole thing is speed, you know, speed kills. So you can't move fast enough with KO. Um, and it's, it, the, the, the big difference for me also, and it ties into the Mantis. The Mantis system for me unlocked karate's ridiculous timing. Karate's timing will get you killed. Okay, because, again, another tool that's, that's used way too often is the makiwara or the striking post. Yeah. So I used to do a 1,000 a day each hand. Take me, I don't know where I had all this time. This is pre-kids. <laughs> <laughs> I've been out there whacking this thing every damn day a thousand times. You know, I had all the, all the mashed up calluses on the knuckles, which I thought were trophies and thought they were cool because yeah. Mario Higana had them as well. So, you know. So I wore them like trophies and the, I don't want to get into the job, but the job I did at a time, I was fighting a lot. And, you know, I'd, I'd hit these people with these punches. I was, but you're not hitting a static target. You're hitting a target and that moves and rotates and you're not going to get that solid strike. So when that strike lands, you're not getting that same feedback. You're almost falling into the shot because the head's so mobile or body's so mobile. Even when you get a clean shot, it's different. Mm. Um, so you have that kind of staccato karate timing of that one strike, one kill, where everything's a kind of a, ah! Now what? So you have almost that weird pregnant pause, which in real application kind of caused a, an oh shit moment. Now coming to the mantis, I don't think you guys ever have that. From day one, you're taught to just fucking plow through the person. And keep going, yeah. Don't stop. Different yeah. mindset, man. It's a completely different mindset. Um, and it, you know, it wasn't until I did the Southern Mantis and, and training with Kyo who also advocates that kind of approach. 
that unlocked the goji roof for me because prior to that time it did not work for me i went i was doing mma i was doing tie boxing i was doing you know other arts to get my fighting experience to equip me for what i was dealing with on the street because the goji roof was failing me wow but then coming away from that and then, and then going full circle and ended up involved with a child guard and ended up with ko it wasn't the system that was failing me it was the way i was applying it was failing it so i was failing the system almost or, or the way it was being taught was failing it it's a very weird um thing to try and get your head around and not uncommon and mm. not common in many many other arts um yeah i, I just want to go back a little bit because um had a question from Jason about uh, uh, Gudrun, Sanchi and Cass is very specific and unique. Can you elaborate on some of the, um, the examples? Actually, um, he's talking about the twisting of the forearms in the Sanchi and Kata, um, why the fist is closed initially, um, mm. diamond shape, uh, morote, nukate, anything you can add to that. Okay, so with the... <coughs> Sorry, could you grab me a water, please? Gin. <laughs> so, <laughs> gin, yeah. So, okay, I've got to really enjoy that. Thanks. Um, so, in, with the San Gin and Goji Ru, we, we, we're this way, right? And it's in a fist. That oral history says that originally it was done open hand, but it got changed to become closed hand. Now, the reason being that I was told, and the one that makes most sense to me, thank you. Okinawans are used to hitting things with the fists. Human beings are used to hitting things with a fist. When you get angry, what do you do? You tie hit up, something. right? <laughs> yeah, you hit something, you know, whether it's with a hammer or a fist or whatever it's gonna be. Even my kids, you know, I watch my kids when they get angry, the fists ball up and they wanna whack something. It's a natural human's trait. Whereas to refine the open hand is a lot more it, it, it needs a lot more work and it needs a lot more work mentally as well to override the natural instinct to make a fist. Mm -hmm. So I believe that there are rumours they remove the open hand to make it more safer for children. I think that's wrong. That doesn't make sense because we still have open hand elsewhere in the forms. I think the more likely um, reason is they played into natural reactions and natural instinctive behaviour where if you get angry, you're gonna make a fist. We know that's gonna happen, so you might as well use it. Mm. You know what I mean? So use what you have, even the blocking methods. You know, the blocking methods, yeah, originally, you know, everything but everything starts big. You have these big blocking movements, which they don't, they don't really work like that. But when you break them down into their smaller component parts, the, the, the head block becomes that, which is what? You know, a fly lands on your face, you, you swat it away, right? Mm. So the head punch, is, it just becomes a parry. Parry, yeah. It's just a parry. It's the same thing you do in MMA, but you know, we, within the martial arts, we go such a long, convoluted way around the houses to get to any sort of classical application. Yeah, totally yeah, agree. Wrong, man. I think you already have this stuff. You know, my understanding is like in big classes, they had to have it structured in a way and make it large, and you just learn this robotic method first before it becomes naturalized. Um, Group cohesion. You know, you have to, it's like being released and allowed to just move naturally again so you move from a natural state to a conditioned state to a natural state again you know yeah you know and, and i think it is that process that you just explained i, th I think we have these natural things mm. you know if 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 you burn your hand on a stove you you you, yeah. what, you you jump off you know if you if you're if you're suddenly frightened you jump if you're angry you open up it's like you have all these natural behaviors that are untrained untapped and unrefined so we go through that process of refinement through doing these very robotic movements or these very structured movements to then go and inform your natural human behaviors and make them viable and weaponized. That was a fantastic answer. And that's actually something I, I, I mentioned uh, a few days ago. I was like, imagine you've been burnt with a hot spoon. That, that reaction is what you're training your body to harness that kind of, that shock power you go from relaxed to and that's what you're trying to do and you've just yeah, that was great that you, you mentioned that wow yeah you know let's come back to jason's question earlier about the breathing Some, something i didn't go into is about how we can switch um kind of like the, the, the state of play within the nervous system 
how we can rev up. You know, I can remember one of my teachers, Mr. Hakama, I was asking him about this, you know, how do you, how do you get kind of like the, uh, what do you call it, some of the energetic stuff or chi, and you know, I was very interested in how you going at the time, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you put this stuff in it? I was only young. How do you add this stuff? He's like, do you, do you ever watch porn? And I was like, huh? He goes, you know, you, you know, you watch porn and you get excited, right? I'm like, yeah. Well, that's it. So he's like, you know, you got you, what he was getting at. Would you need that that visualization, that that internal stimulus to raise the energy? In that case, he's talking about raising sexual energy. Yeah. If you want to raise your fighting energy, yeah, you've got to be able to recreate that same stimulus within your forms. But if you mm. can't, it's a dead form. Mm-hmm. Yep, it's got to come alive. Yeah. yeah. Intent. This is what it's saying. Um, the just going back onto the form, onto the sanction. It, it doesn't like uh, Jay, there's another question from Jason which says Scotland doesn't seem to have a deep and separate hate practice like SPM. Um, but it talks about the Kiko methods uh, are sprinkled throughout the preparatory methods of uh, the kata and the, uh, or the methods and the kata. Can you elaborate a bit on these? Yeah, so Kiko just basically means hey go. Right. Um, or, or methods working with chi or, or ki in Japanese. Yeah. We. <coughs> <coughs> Gojuru has its own it, it has its own Hegel methods um, the, <coughs> excuse me Corona man it has its it has its own methods you know they're not widely taught or widely known but certainly within KO's group we have we have a number of Hegel methods um, some are specifically related to certain kata in order to to rev them up to prep them before you do the kata some are within the Taiso de Ruma. Sanchin in itself is a form of Hagun. Tencho is a form of Hagun. There are certain kata which are more Hagun dominant than fighting technique dominant. So more energetic work, more yeah. internal based. Yeah. Um, so it's in there. It's, it's, just, it's just not something that's very widely spoken about or understood really. Mm. Fascinating. Um, Guy, can you explain the connection with New York? How did that come about? And how did you, uh, I mean, why New York? And obviously it's chaos there, but how did that happen? What, what kind of took you there? So I, this would go back to 2012, 2013. At the time I'd written a few of the books. I had quite a well-established YouTube channel. I had a blog, you know, it was quite well established in the Goju room. You know, people kind of knew who I was. Not that I was any good, but like, I was out there. Um, a video of mine ended up on KO's group on Facebook, and he ripped it to shreds. You know, meanwhile, every, on all the other forums, everyone's like, oh, look at this guy, you know, he's good and blah, blah, blah. He gets to KO, and he's like, this guy's shit. I'm like, ooh. So then I, I wrote, I commented on you. I said, well, you know, can you tell me what I'm doing wrong? Now, I, I knew of KO, that's the thing. Uh, I knew of him and I knew of his reputation. So when he came out, when he came out and said that, it gave me a glimmer of hope because I was very feeling at that time that I'd reached a little bit of a ceiling within the system. That, you know, there weren't too much further to go. I was running out of leads. I was kind of getting quite depressed with it. So when that video got to KO and he said it was shit, I was like... You knew that if he's saying it's shit, there must be... What do you know? Yeah, what 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 is it then? So you know, I know it's not I know it's not great, but everyone else is telling me it's okay. Mm. You're the first person telling me it sucks. So that you know, so what you know anyway, so I wrote and said, you know, what am I doing wrong? And he went off on one. He went crazy. Who are you to ask me anything? I don't know you, blah blah blah. You wanna know you come out here and see if you can take me on. <laughs> so he threw down a challenge and I was like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> um and I think, I think he'd done that in a way to test me, you know, to see if I, because he, 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 he'd probably be annoyed that I'm even mentioning his name because he'd get emails and get pestered by people. But, you know, I think he did that just to throw it down to say, if you're serious, you'll come. If not, you won't. So he threw that out just to put me off, basically. So I booked a flight and went over there and he, he you know, he met me at the airport sort of thing. Um... And bear in mind, you know, at that time he said, you know, I don't lift any weights, I don't do any makiwa or anything like this. And so he met me at the airport and I shook his hand, but his hand, his hand was nuts. I mean, this, you've seen the photo oh of him. Oh, my God. He's a keeper, right? Seriously, like, 
like he he reminds me of Sifu Paul. He's got right. wrists like this, hands like that, forearms that just go on for days, and you're yeah. just thinking, holy shit! If this Crazy dude, enough. if this dude grabs you or hits you, you're gonna know about it. Yeah, so there was that crazy development. So literally, I met him at the airport, shook his hand, and I was like, oh, my God. And I knew I was, was going to get tested, so we ended up in his, in his apartment. And his apartment is it's the, like, the weirdest setup. I can only explain It's probably similar to um, Grandmaster's place in Hong Kong. Like, it has a very weird vibe to it. You know, and there's like the altar there, and there's all these, these Buddhist statues everywhere. It has a very, very weird energy. So we're in there and we're talking and then his face changes and that's the first time I've seen him power up. And I'm like, oh, fuck. And then he gets up and we do a couple of tests of strength sort of thing. I end up on his floor. He throw, well, And then he tells me to punch him. So I punch him and I bounce off. I end up on the floor. And he goes, oh, what are you saying to me? I told you to punch me, not, not give me a blowjob sort of thing. And I'm on my knees, I'm like that. And I'm like, oh my. This, it was just, it was bizarre. It was the most weirdest, surrealist thing ever. Um, but yeah, I, I got owned. And then, you know, from that time, it, it, was, it was good. I, you know, I showed him I had a little bit of spirit. And then, you know, he, he's been teaching me since. And, you know, he's never asked for anything in return. And I've been just to do me best with it and don't forget. That's fantastic. Um... Is he, is he still teaching in, has he got a school in Hong yeah, Kong? Yeah, he's, he's got a school in um, yeah, New York, Chinatown. Yeah, still has a school at the moment. Um, yeah. So, how does the go, so what you're learning is, is goju, right? Yeah. Goju. Mm. How is that different? Like, what, 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 what have you, what are you learning now? Or what, what, what are the concepts or things that are now that you're like, I wish I knew this 10 years ago. Or I knew, or what, what's different? What, what makes him like that Goju guy that you're like, that's who I, have, that's who I should have gone to in the beginning? What's, what's like, different? K.O. was very lucky in some respects with circumstance because he, he grew up, he, he's Chinese. He's not, he's not Japanese, he's Chinese. K.O.'s a nickname. Um, so he studied many Chinese arts just because of the family structures and the community and stuff. So he, he was fortunate to learn from a lot of, you know, very notable teachers within the Chinatown community in New York. He already had that base before he ever went to Gojiru. Now, the reason he went to Gojiru because of the gang problems in 1970s New York Chinatown, it was a war zone. You know, he lost relatives, you know, and, and you know, he was attacked by the gangs himself and he, he had to remove himself from that whole um, environment. <coughs> But still loved the martial arts, and you know, so he he he, he drifted towards the Okinawan arts to differentiate differentiate himself from the gangs. However, he had his basis within the Chinese arts. So the the way he tells me, it's it's like learning Latin. If you know Latin, you can kind of understand a lot of the different European languages, right? So when when it comes to learning the Goju Ru, for him it was simple because he already had the understanding of the stuff that had been left out of the Okinawan arts or been um, not misplaced, but just not transmitted very well. Mm -hmm. So he could see through the forms. He could, he could, he could understand what they were getting at without having to do this whole thing that everybody else is doing of traveling to China to try and find the roots. He could add it in his DNA from the, the circles he was moving in. Um, and he was fortunate enough to learn from, you know, uh, I think it was three different, first generation students of Miyagi. So what he learned within the Goju group was a very pure, unadulterated version of the pre-World War II kata. So there's elements within our forms that, that are not really found in, in other schools or other mainstream schools that, again, make a lot of difference when it comes to actual application, you know? So, um, and then aside from that, his ability to teach Put it this way, if, if I didn't, if I gave up martial arts today, I would still go visit him just to be coached in life. Mm. You know, with regards to someone who's able to get inside your mindset and, and undo the mental blocks you put on yourself, that's his real skill. I think above and beyond the martial arts, forget all that stuff. His real skill is, is as a coach and a teacher. 
And yeah. that's probably what I've learned most from him. Even the stuff I do at the PT farm is, is, is based on his teaching methods. Even the way I talk, it, everything, it's a, it, a lot of stuff's come from him. It's really weird. And what's even weirder, my kids, you know, they, they teach my kids class. They talk like K.O. When they teach class, it's like I'm sitting there watching K.O. It's really odd. Little, little K.O.s. Yeah. Little K.O.s, man. And that's they're doing this. Him, yeah, he calls, him, he calls, calls them his, cake, uh, his Kool-Aid crew. But, you know, it's, and again, it's that transmission. It's, not, it's nothing intentional. Yeah. You're, you're not trying to copy your teacher or anything weird like no, that. You, you, that you, you do develop a bond as well. If you're close to your, your teacher, if you're serious about it, you, just, you do spend time with them. You, you do develop traits. And it's not the copying, but mm. I've seen it. I've seen it in others. Little phrases that come out that, that they learn. That's how they learn, you know, with those yeah. Did you learn the, the, the Thai Senderuma from Kale? Was that already part of the, the Goju? Oh, you did. No, I learned from Kale. That's why I went the first time. That's why I went specifically to learn the Thai Senderuma. Wow. wow. <coughs> and it, 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 I was fit at the time. <coughs> you know, I've, I've been fighting, boxing, all sorts of I was fit. You know, you, you know what I'm like. I'm, I've yeah. always been like this. Um, and it, man, it, I blew up. It was hard. It's, it's no joke. It's, yeah. it's a very, very hard, hard sequence. So, if I remember what you said earlier, you said with the Thai Sederumo, you fill the gaps, or you can fill the gaps with the the Chisi, the 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 the, 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 the ancient training methods. Mm. So, Ko doesn't like using those, or so how does he fill those gaps, or is it is that? So he he gets a lot of his students very young from the high school. So he teaches within the high school curriculum in, okay. in New York City. So a lot of his students start with him from young age, you know, 13, 14, get some straight out of the tie side of rumor. They never develop the bad habits that we get. Oh. Of the structural problems, the lack of posterior mm. development, the lack of mobility. He, he gets in there before all that stuff sets in, you know, and then he gets the like of, likes of me who come along later and he's just like, oh man, you're ruining my system. You can't do it, you know? Interesting, um, talking about the structure, because um, there's another question from Jason, who, who he's asked quite a few good questions, and he's he talking about the um, structure between uh, Gojuru and the Southern Praying Mantis. The structures are slightly different, and how do you, how do you kind of um, <coughs> cope with that, as it were? The, I, I don't, <coughs> Excuse me. I don't mix the two, and that's something that Ko is very, very particular with as well. That, as I said, he knows Bakmay, Southern Mantis, Wing Chun, um, Goju Ru, and, and a number of other stuff. None of them overlap. They're all in their box, ready to take out as and when they need. Same for me with the Mantis and the Goju Ru. Again, though, to come back to what I was talking about, the breathing on the surface they look a little different. So, you know, a little bit more rounded with, with the Southern Man. It's a little bit more waist movement, that kind of thing. But, and the stepping method, something Jason asked specifically about, stepping method being different, because we have the semi circle step. You guys have a more, you know, we have that too. Within the Seisan Kata or the 13, the 13 Kata, we have that same stepping method. The rounding of the back, now correct me if I'm wrong, even though you guys round the back, there's still a back engagement. You're not, you're not just folding. No, no, no. The back, feeding of, rounding of the back happens this way, not right. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Things sink the chest. The chest sinks down, and the back pumps out. Drop your shoulders, and that so that now for us engages the the back is engaged with the arms, meaning that any movement you've got, you're putting your back into your arm movement. If yeah. you're too, you know, for us, if if you're too straight, your shoulder blades are out. The back's disengaged meaning that this arm is only the shoulder and arm yes. uh, doing all the work. But as soon as you, as soon as you adopt that shape, now you, you're using your whole body structure through your arm. Right. So it's, it's, it's the same thing. So when, when you make the Sanchin position, mm. I can't see my camera very well. We can see it. Um, yeah. So a lot, a lot of people... Oi, oi. Go on, so when, <laughs> You know, go... Sanchin Goju Ru has become very open. A lot of, the, a lot of the ways I'm seeing now, it's becoming very open. So they're allowing all this, the scapula to now come out and back. Yeah. When we do it, it's here. Yeah. So it's that same, that same it's lay down, that same, 
It's the yeah. same. Yeah. It's the same. It's the yeah. Same. Yeah. You do see a lot of um, sub madness as well. They they over curve and they overemphasize that shape. But really, you know, it should be straight and chest is just sunk down. That yeah. swallowing of the chest is what gives you um, is, is relaxing the chest and allowing the connection around the back. Because if for us, if you pump the chest out, then the connections around the front, and and that's not what we're trying to get the um, the dynamic different. You know, I'm not saying that's other systems use that method, especially long range. They'll kind of use the chest and the bicep to, to get that mm. long range power, but we're after the shorter power, so and, yeah, yeah. And, and that's the thing, <coughs> it, it, it has become very focused on the chest and here. Mm. Now, to come back to some of my problems that I was developing through an overuse of the Hoja Rondo, I started developing a real shortness of, of the pecs. Yeah, and a real underdevelopment of the rear delts. My whole posture was starting to do this. Yeah, you know, I was starting to really get hunched over. Pulling shoulders. you in, yeah. Pulling me in. Everyone was pulling me in because I was doing so much of this. Yeah, you know, to to the extent, um, you know, I've done a hell of a lot to address this now. Yeah, and and fix things. But um, I detached my pec last May, just because it's so short and so over tight through yeah. years of of training. You know, perhaps incorrectly for my body. You know, I've, I've damaged myself through training that way. Yeah, same as me. I, for years, you know, we go on a journey and did, I think we touched on it before, but like, you know, early on in my my training, I was was training and not with the right information. And uh, so the overemphasis was on a particular shift. It takes years to undo a lot of that damage that's done. Yeah. And, um, and then... For me, it was I was doing a lot of that with a, too much stress on the back and, and working, spending a lot of time on a computer. So my shape was like this, you know, with it yeah. hanging here. And it took me a lot of time to kind of address it to get the um, try and get a straighter back, and and I constantly re-emphasise that with myself because it is healthy to have an open chest and an upright position, you know. And when you need to just drop it, that's when you need it. It's that split second for the action that you need, not not to overemphasize it and build right. your body that way. It's not healthy yeah. to walk around like an old man, like, you know? Yeah, yeah. The thing is you're, you're <laughs> learning to engage those muscles or those that areas at any given time. So obviously not having that posture, overemphasizing it, I think people are, are, are getting the whole kind of, with Manis, it's that kind of basket weave back. So they have that in mind and they're overemphasizing it. So they're, yeah. they're far t too low, they're crunching up and it doesn't allow them to be like, to you have an it, whenever you're it's that natural stance and then when you engage it's that small yeah, movement, yeah, yeah. and that's what's going to get the power up through the back and out and that's it it's just that small movement and that's that's right, the development right. that you need to have because if you're already like this how can you go from this to to that you can't so you know, we talked about the development of um power being in stages and the development of structure also goes through stages, I think. And, and so some of the techniques, you say, they, they start off large and they, they come small. Um, and the, again, the posture, to, to kind of get into the uh, structure of, of uh, you know, your fighting stance or even even for the forms, when you get into the forms, there's, there's no great difference. It all becomes tighter. It's all happening, boom, internally, and then these minor adjustments to the body. Yeah, and... Uh, with with the sambo jin you know you have that first bit where you open and you open up the chest and i was always taught you have to open up your chest yes. and then close and don't it's just a small movement but you're getting used to that whole hong open and closing so you're, you're not um, constantly you're, doing that with and that I, sec, there is a, a the, the words that describe the movements in the bar sec in haka it's just this movement is open your chest. Yeah, that's it. Open and this, your and this one, yeah, close, you know. Yeah. So I say, uh, big up, big up your chest. Yeah, open, <laughs> close. <laughs> do, do, does, did the Taiso, sorry, the, the Taiso, did that um, show the weakness in your posture? Well, are there movements that go open and suddenly you're doing all these movements and the similarities with with the kind of yoga influence and things like that? Did that suddenly make you think, holy shit, like, Mm. I've got issues here with my shoulders, with my hips, with massively, you know, especially overhead movements, which 
there's there's a rumor that once you if you do go to rue once you reach 50 you lose all your overhead movements it's an old wives towel yeah but you know my, my, the truth be told my overhead mobility is still not great but it was awful i'll post up a, a before and after wow. in the group of when one's from one of my books in i think it was 2011 compared to two years ago and the overhead it, it was it, i looked like an old man at the time i was in my 20s terrible my, my, my actual lack of overhead loop. same all my all my shoulder range of motion in my shoulders was gone range of movement in my spine was gone mm. range of movement in my hips was gone before i hit 30. <clears throat> yeah i've had similar things not i've, I've got so tired and i've had shoulder problems for ages so it's a lot of time to correct it couldn't even lie flat on the floor because my, my shoulders are just so hunched like that and mm. it's painful to try and get my shoulders down so yeah. you know um it's great that you have words for people that are training you know <coughs> and it's, it's great that you have that now in your in your goju from from ko i mean that mm -hmm. that must have just been a uh, you know that moment where you're like oh my god this is this is you know this is what i've been missing uh, a question from lynn um i was taught to really push the big toe down when stepping in san chin any similarities there kind of in, so the command grip the floor now I've heard you using it as well mm. sometimes that command can cause people to claw which raises the, mm. the, the sole of the foot right it starts yeah, to yeah. create that bubble and actually causes you to have less contact space with the ground yeah so the command we tend to use is spread the toes or, or sink the roots so yeah. it's more that as opposed to that got you yeah if that makes sense so yes that's a, you, that's a great concept and one that i have to apply because I, I i don't do that but i do what you're saying it's like i imagine it's that and it's clawing like that mm. I, I kind of um use the idea of pressing and drawing the toes so once they're pressed and you draw it grips but if you if you grip with the toes like you say that they lose right. your chan. Yeah, you, trying, yeah. yeah, you lose that kind of um, the main grip and focus on. So I just think of that as a plopper, you know, just to <laughs> suck on the floor energetically. That's my contact point, and I press and then draw the toes mm. to, to kind of get that grip. Yeah, the the, the way I'm 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 using it at the moment, my understanding within the goju room um, is yes to pin the big toe like Lin saying. <coughs> And then think of with the other toes to actually build. Mm. Let's actually project. Yeah, interesting. You know, and it will also come back to, to something that, that um, Jason spoke about as well about the diamond shape. I didn't come back yeah. to that earlier, but the diamond shape again within the Goji room. I can't see my camera. I'm on the like, no. tiny bit in the corner. I see you. But when you do, when you do this posture here, so the, the posture he's talking about is here. Yeah. A lot of people have weak hands or dead hands. The whole point when you do it is to engage this. the thing. That's right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's a difference, and, and that was one of the first things Kyo ever showed me. That was in the drive from the, from the airport. It was like, you know, can you can you get flexion within the last digits of, of the fingers? Because mm. that's natural rip, natural grab, without having to grab, Yeah, you know? Um, and I guess, and I also see this with the jars, that some of them are, are so wide that you are just yeah. gripping yeah. with that. There's, you know, there, there's an old, um, I think within the Waichi room, <coughs> John Kearney will probably jump on with this one, but they used to have big concrete or stone blocks, and there would be a tiny lip cut in like that. And the only way you could grab them would be with these final um, digits. You know, much like a rock climber, you know, you yeah. see Alex Honnold on his like, sheer wall, he's just getting that final bit in there. But they'd walk around with these blocks, you know, rather than the jars. Wow. Yeah, and, and and that's a good thing that you bring up, right? and something Alex and I really, uh, really put forward when you're doing your forms. Even when you're coming down, you still have that engagement just here. That's it. Engage it's when you hit. Right to the fingers. Yeah, when you're here, hit like this. When you come down to to chop style, it's still engaging. Yeah. When you come up, you're you're clawing. Don't let go of the power. It's always Don't, there. It's on. Yeah. Even those transition points between it's on standby. Mm. Or before it kind of comes back, it goes out and then comes back, but you don't let go of it and then begin again. It's it's there's a continual movement of the energy, it's constant. 
start mm. to finish and perform. Mm. And, um, and then, you know, so if we talk about forearm development or grip development, which Miyagi Chojin was known as the <coughs> as the meat tearer, he could grab chunks of beef and just rip it and tear it. But no one has that grip strength no more in Goju Ru. Mm. And then when I, you know, then you see Ko with his forearms and you get grabbed by him, you're like, holy shit, this stuff's legit. Yeah. But it's trained so that, you know, it's not so much even the finger development, it's what's happening further up the chain as a result of that. Do you, sorry, with your, with your sang chin as well, do you, is there an emphasis, in, are you thinking of tendons? Is that, an, is that a real emphasis in your training, tendons rather than the muscles? Yes, yes. Um, both, both really, but yeah, tendons and a lot of, a lot of silk reading, a lot of rotation. Yeah. Through the joint. So you're, you're, you're taking a joint, putting it into flexion and then rotating through that yeah, yeah. to actually increase the surface area that's being worked sort of thing. So mm. it's basically a form that you're working time under tension. For, that's you know, it. It's Lovely. hard, man. No, it is, man. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to tell me. <laughs> go through. One, one other point um, that was of interest. When you step do you just slide your foot or do you step toes first or heel first? What, what is it that you do? Generally, <coughs> generally speaking, um, the big toe will kind of lead the movement. So the big toe will be, comes back to what Lynn was saying, the big toe will, will slightly press down, the other toes will lift and you'll step like, in a semi circle. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, just but, and like feeling the way for us yeah. to just, yeah. Yeah, but again, it depends. It, it depends on the form. It depends on the the intent and what you have in mind. There will be there will be times where I will actually lift the foot and step, but it, uh, it will again depend on yeah. the era of the form. Some would walk literally like like a chicken step, you know. It it, it depends. It just depends. Mm. I'm going to switch it up. So, just because it came, it was actually one of the first questions that no, came no. up when we asked. Yeah. So, who was the real villain in the Karai Kid, Daniel Larusso or Johnny? And can you tell us the story about Cobra Kai as it relates to you? Oh man! All right. So, um, Karate Kid. Karate Kid was written by. If you look on the credits, it's written by Robert Kamen. Yeah. Robert Kamen studied with Kamen. Okay. Now, the Cobra Kai. A lot of the characters in there are named after people I personally know. No way. Right? Mr. Miyagi was a, a janitor for an apartment complex who collected bonsais and had an interest in classic cars. That's Kamo. Ah. Right? So he's, he's, he, he owns an apartment complex and he's, you know, he's the, 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 the overall boss there collects the bonsires, has the DeLorean, the Bentley, the Rolls Royce, all that stuff. Um, the Cobra Kai is us. It's, it's, it's his students. We're the Cobra Kai. You're Johnny. I'm Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little bit before my time, but yeah. Johnny, the leg. <laughs> Johnny's named after, Johnny's not, maybe a story for off air, but he's named after a particular student. Um, they, yeah, they're all named after wow. students of, of, of KO. But, yeah, you realise that was a, that was a new dimension to the yeah, film. Huh? That was that was a joke question, but like you flipped it. Yeah, no, legit, man. It's it's written by a student of Ko, and and a, a lot of the there's a lot of in jokes within it. Right. There's a lot of it, you know in house jokes, especially in Karate Kid Two. We gotta go. You know, we gotta go back and watch that, Alex. Definitely, right. I love that film. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, Who doesn't like? So you're you're telling us it is Daniel San. <laughs> That, Daniel Sam, I don't know who Daniel Sam is 100%. I have a theory, but I don't know who <laughs> that is 100%. But yeah, a lot of it is based on actual fact. And if you look at Robert Kamen's other movies, so he, he also made the Transporter movies, Taken, mm. um, yeah. Kiss of the Dragon. Um, yeah, they're, one. They're, all, they're all based on Kyo, man, and his exploits. Cr really? But yeah, legit. Yeah, a question. Cool. This is, these are stories for a further, another time. This is definitely. I said to him, I said to him you know, you, you should you should write a book. He went, I don't have to. They've already made movies. <laughs> <laughs> How true is that? Uh, we've got a question um, regarding the Makiwara. Um, uh, I mean, you mentioned that you you were training, but uh, are these tools? Are the Makiwara? Are the Kongo Ken? 
are they still important? Like to me, d d yeah, to you or to well, in general. Actually, in general. Okay, I'll answer both. To me, no. Mm. I've, I've been there, done that, got what I needed from it, and now if I go back, they don't give me anything else. Okay, I would get more from doing barbell work or, or you know, like, like other you know, kettlebell stuff or maybe where I can increase the amount of resistance. Yeah. With the whole job, it's, it's, it's all very, very light equipment, you know. Uh, it trains the tendons, it trains the structure, it trains movement patterns. But once it's served its purpose, discard it. Kyle explains it like a crutch. Like if you, if you, is it the, the, in the beginning to build that raw power, that raw aggression or whatever, use it, then later on, different methods? Yeah, it's, it's, like, it's like if you broke your leg and you got a crutch. You know, once that leg's healed, you, you don't need the crutch no more. Get rid of it. You know, unless you, you're, the only reason you're retaining it is for a fashion implement or mm. to make a YouTube video or something or, like that. Or that you're know? used to it and you know it, and so that you're the safety and safety state. blanket. Yeah, it's a comfort blanket. Yeah, you know, um, the the Makiwara <coughs> became a, an actual hindrance to me. It became a problem because the, the the job I was doing, one, I couldn't have the calluses. Two, my habit was to punch people. And I was getting myself in trouble. Mm. It looks for real, man. Let him laugh. And she's like, she's like, my wife's laughing at me at the moment. But you know, legit, it's it's harder to justify punching someone with a closed fist than it is to hit them with a palm or or, or even you know like a, a a sword hand or anything like that. Yeah, not that, we're, uh, not that we're ever advocating this to people, but <laughs> no, but you you, you know where yeah, I'm going. You're with right. It, you're right. It's, it's exactly that. That is right. If you you know if you could use cl clenched fist. Your, your next kind of yeah and, and you know yeah, I, I was pass them away <laughs> yeah I, I, you know I, I, I was um I, would, I was consciously trying to override the instinct to punch so I was practicing a lot more open hands so I was you know like, the, the Goju and Kath are predominantly open hand mm. yeah my habitual behavior was to bloody punch what even after training with the even after training it's it's just, a every day yeah. thousand yeah. times a day each hand that was my habitual behavior man yeah. No matter how many forms I did, I'm not going to out rep those I thousand thought, hits each hand. No way, no, not at all. Yeah. Um, with with Goju, do you still see a connection with traditional medicine and healing? Things like uh, ditta or uh, traditional massage. Uh, that that kind of you know that traditional Chinese <coughs> medicine. Do you have that like traditional Japanese medicine even? No, within the Gojiru, the Miyagi Chojin apparently was a bone setter. His teacher who studied in China um, apparently learned the Chinese medicine and brought it back to Okinawa, but did not teach it. Oh. Um, within some systems on Okinawa, there were medicine elements. Again, has not been passed down. So in, in to make a long story short, it's not survived to present day, which is why I went to learn with Sifu Paul initially to, to put some of that back into my art because I had an interest, especially in the, 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 the massage methods to fix the injuries. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was there, but it no longer is, unless it's in closed door schools, but I've never seen it. Okay. Alex, do you have anything? Um, no, I've just been ch trying to trawl through and I can't see any new questions. Um, we've okay. got ones, I think, main, main ones that we had here. Um, and you've added quite a bit of um, insight into it. There's maybe one last question. The Tensho handshapes. Oh, that's interesting. I'd actually know about that. Do you see similarities between yeah, handshapes? Any similarities to Southern Mantis with those? It's all over the Southern Mantis. It's all over. It's the Southern Mantis system. Um, especially um, Super Ongen. That, that's Tensho. As far right. as I'm concerned, it's it's mm. a, it's a it's an expanded and a more in depth version of Tensho. Tensho, you could say, would be footnotes of it. Mm. And Tensho is a, um, a form a kata. Yeah, Tensho, Tensho is is based on the Sanchin framework. Um, it was it was created by Miyagi Chojin, and he, what he did was he added some hand forms that were doing the rounds in Okinawa that were quite popular. So to make a real long story short, you had, you had like a crane block up, 
and then the palm down, then it comes out and then it comes in. And yes. then repeat left and then both hands do the same uh, movement. So it has, you know, you, you see this all over the southern systems, even in the Weichi room they have it. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's done as an energy form, it's done as a developmental form, not so much for fighting as such. It's more a Heigong form um, yeah. and, and should we say, a, a, a next level to the Sanchin. We've had a question come in on, on the group from Nick. Um, uh, uh, can you talk about Higuana Sensei and oh, um, how that connects with with uh, with Goju? And uh, apparently he used Dit Dar as well, but I, I don't know if, if you know. So Dit Dar, you know, Dit Dar. Uh, obviously, you guys know it's it's a, it's a much broader subject than just hitting a yeah. Makawara and rubbing it on your hands. Yeah, yeah which is that's the extent of it within Goju Ru. Okay. You do some conditioning, you, you rub the didar on you. Yeah. There's no formulas handed down. There's no there's no methods into how to use it. It's just you, you get it from someone who you know can make it and then rub it on you. Yeah. All right. That's the extent of it. Yeah, it's it's good. Good. Um, you know, it's it's good to kind of know that as well because um, there's a lot of people think that there's a, a much more in depth medicinal stuff in some of the um, arts because I've seen people using iron palm formula and stuff like that in certain arts, you know, that they do this before and, you know, see documentaries of people, maybe they have, maybe they've got family traditional formulas passed down, but it's much, much, much broader in the Chinese systems. Definitely. You know, it, it, you guys know if, if you use the wrong formula for the wrong thing, it can, it can do more damage than good. Mm. You know, there's ones where there's, there's did our medicine where, where you would, it would have herbs in which would soften the bones which would be better for the iron palm, but would be detrimental for using it on an injury to a, to a bone or a fracture. Mm. So again, it depends on what you've got and why you're using it and when and how. And again, people using it as like a vinaigrette. So I just get it on there, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you've got the right one, you can have a general training format. You splash that on and just train wet, you know, but that's a specific general training formula. We'll just kind of um, uh, soak in it, kind of takes all the little knocks and bangs out as you train and afterwards, obviously. But um, there's others that's a bit more specific to certain injuries as well. And chronic injuries, it might be a different yeah. formula. Yeah. yeah. So Higona, to come back to the question, that Higona um, is obviously probably the most well-known goju root teacher out there still to this day. Um, and he, you know, he's a big thing around the conditioning. You know, he has the big rock and he, you know, hits with a rock and he punches the wall and all that kind of thing. Um, Interesting. Oh, Nick says, "Oh yeah, he because he used Makora, he had he had Chinese suppliers send him did that." Yeah, <laughs> yeah he, you know, he, we, yeah, that, and that's the thing, and that's that's why I used to go to Yap Long. You know, you, you get one from him because you get some really crappy dip da jiao. Oh, you can. You, can, you can get some awful stuff. You might as well put brute on your hand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's who you know, right? And yeah. yeah, if you if you're gonna if you're gonna do Makiwara and, and Iron Palm, that you it's definitely get a good Dittar formula because you you will cause damage. I yeah. know people say they want. I've even written in my long books term. you won't. You will. You so you do long term damage. Long, yeah. yeah. I'm paying the price now for some dumb stuff I did as a kid. You know, yeah. and, and that's the truth of the matter. So, uh, Gary, before I kind of move on to where you are now with uh, PT Farm, um, do you want to comment on the state of Goju Ryu today and what you hope for it in the future? Okay. Um, oh man, what are you trying to do? I mean, eh? I don't know, man. It's just a question. Uh, it? It's an yeah. ask me anything. <laughs> um, the state of it today. Olympics has happened in what all was, was going to happen. Karate is now part of it. As a result, what you've seen is almost a kickback against it from Okinawa. So there's almost a movement to separate Okinawa karate from Olympic karate, which is great. However, in doing that, I feel they've kind of, they're killing it. They're choking it of its essence. Because in an attempt to bring everybody together, everybody's now trying to conform. Everyone's trying to fit within the box. So the Goju is losing its flavor. 
it's developing a weird timing which is influenced from mainland karate uh, it's, it's starting to look like shoulder pants and make a long story yeah. short well, you know sorry the performance um, mm. stuff that they do as well can can bleed into it people then start training to get that sharpness detachment yes. sharpness detachment that's exactly it that's exactly it. it's developing that that weird timing where it's done for visual effects rather than actual use i feel it's become very slow i become i feel it's become a system that's no longer viable for the majority of people practicing it how it's being practiced i also feel within okinawa i've not seen much coming off the island which would make me want to go back there you wouldn't you wouldn't you wouldn't go back and train you wouldn't go to okinawa to specifically train with anyone over there no no, there's, 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 there's nowhere which would which jump it out at me which would make that journey worth it. I'd go there to sightsee and to show my, my kids it and that kind of thing, but with regards to actual training, there's nothing there for me anymore. What about in any other karate? Um, I feel on the island, the Weichiru is probably the only art that has retained its essence, and I feel even that is starting to wane. Um, and again, John will probably elaborate on that a lot more than I. But I, I think even that is starting to develop this weird. This what, weird do you think? Sport timing. It, it, do you think that's what it is? Is it a result of the sport competition element, or do you think it's just it, it, it's been diluted through time? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's it's partly that, but I also think that the youngsters in Okinawa have have very little interest in the art. They're more into the baseball and the cars and that kind of thing. It just happens. Yeah. So now the older generation, the you know the older generation that I enjoy training with, most of those are now, are now dead. The ones underneath those were not of the same caliber. You know, mm. I'll say it straight that they were not of the same caliber. Even if you look at Mario Hagona, when when he goes, now whatever I think of Mario Hagona is irrelevant. When he goes, there's no one within his organisation who will be able to fill that void. In my opinion. And I think that's the same for every single school over there because the headmaster of the dojo dies and the ones who take over, they're, they're not a patch on, on the, the original. So if we go back to your early days, 20s, early 20s, before kind of KO and Goju and that's how you're doing. So do you still see people with the similar mindset and the similar saying the similar things that you were you were looking at and you were training in back then now like, yeah to, to be fair I, I see within probably the same generation as me i can probably think off the top of my head a handful of others who are going through the same process that i went through and are arguably a bit more serious than i was even wow um, so i you know i, I hope I, I i personally think it's left the island and it's now elsewhere in the world. Um, but I think there's enough interested people out there that if they found the right people, they could do very well with it. And they could, you know, within KO's organization, there's some people who, if, if, if they were seen, they would blow the world away. Put it that way. You know, I, I, are they, I, are they, yeah. is it just, I mean, are they not that well known? Do they just keep to themselves and train and they're just happy to, yeah. No, they're just, just going in, they go twice a week, train, that's it, it's no big deal. And, and, and that's, that's KO's thing, you shouldn't become karate backup or karate crazy. It should just be something you pick up and put down, it's like, it's, you know, it's no biggie. Don't let it interfere with the rest of your life, you know. Get the art, get it quick, be done with it. I like Don't that, get the out. art and get it quick and be able to switch it on yeah, but when, when you need it. Shortcuts, it's like, there are sh no shortcuts, it's that hard training, isn't it? You just train, train. Cons uh, you know, cons like uh, just consistently mm. okay so I think we've done quite a bit on, on Goju and the S Southern Prey Mantis piece um, uh, is there anything you want to add to that Gary or anything no All right. oh, man, I, think, I think yeah we've no, that was good. And I, I've actually, I will say thank you because I even learned some things from you yeah. when it comes to the way that I teach or the way that I will apply even in my own training, just from some of these concepts or things that you, you said. They're there, but you just made me remind, remind or click me, click something. And definitely, you know, one day I want to try and uh, 
come down and see you in person once all of this yeah, stuff is over and, and do some uh, do some of the Taisu drama. So before we kind of finish off, and I know it's late, thank you for staying late. Uh, you know, it's almost 10 o'clock, but I, I do oh, appreciate no that. You you know, you, you in a short space, you know, in a very, I just messaged you and said, can you do a talk? And you would bang on, you were like, <coughs> yeah, I'll do it. So I appreciate that. And I, and I hope the group uh, uh, appreciates it too. Um, coming forward and where you are now, PT farm, training, strength and conditioning. Um, how do you feel that is benefiting your training and your your karate or your martial arts? It's it's an extension of it, you know. Um, for me, when I teach martial arts, it's unless the person is of an occupation where they are a fighter, I teach martial arts in a way to try and benefit the person physically and more so mentally. So the people who come through the doors of, of, a, of a martial arts school, generally, they're very similar. There's, there's that little bit of self-doubt, that's that little bit of, you know, they're unsure of themselves, a little bit, they want to develop themselves in some way. Well, it's the same with PT. When people come through your doors as a PT, and there is the, the, those same issues going on, those same conflicts. And then your job as a coach or a Sifu or a sensei is to resolve them conflicts and enable them to meet elements of themselves they didn't know they had. And through meeting those elements, discover who the hell they actually are. Just lifting the mask on them so they can see their true face. You know? And so I see my role no different whether I'm teaching martial arts or whether I'm teaching um, personal training. It's the same job. And do you think that you can still... Do you still think there's still added value in, in pushing weight and that can apply to martial arts? Is that still something that you would i mean it doesn't necessarily have to be the old school conky mm. and all that but mm. do, you, do you still see value in mm. it, whatever it is like stand like deadlifting and mm. I, I think I, I think it will depend where you want to go with it if if you if you want to put it this way who who really has 20 years to invest in the art these days mm. how many out of out of every hundred people who come through your door how many are going to stick the course of 20 years to develop a yeah. real deep understanding of the art it's got to be minimal right yeah now here's the genius of Miyagi Chojin and his system with the goju Ru and all of the, the his focus on the weight training he believed in developing the ability to knock down an opponent with whatever technique you use that's the same as you know the shock powers you guys therefore he changed his approach to be about body development so that you just become strong and you just become confident and you learn about the mindset and you just become strong yeah so it became that way so then if, if we talk about martial arts the majority of people you get through the door chances are they're, going, they're not going to stay the course they want to learn some quick techniques they want to get a bit of interest and get a bit fitter it's relevant to them if they persist past the five-year stage where pretty much they're going to stick with the art now Okay, then you maybe change your approach a little bit. This is just my opinion. Mm. Um, but from personal experience, and this is why I've closed my school, very, very few people stay the course. And the amount of time you invest to getting them to get the old school attributes, generally speaking, the, 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 the attrition rate is too high. Yeah. Not easy at all. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. On your, your books, Gary, you've got... An author of four books. Yeah, I think it's four. I think it's four. Think uh, it's where four. where can they get? Are they on Amazon or? Yeah, Amazon. Yeah, if you search my name, they're on there. Some some are some are good. Some are not so good. No, it depends. It depends. You know what I mean? They're, they're still they're relevant. It's just I now look back on them. Your, your knowledge. Who the hell was it wrote this? I saw something. There was a meme today. I can't remember who posted it. Where you look back on something you said five years ago, and you're like, oh my god. Yeah, you know, it's it's that kind of thing. It's not that it's bad information or anything like that. It's just my my, my looking at it now is kind of like, oh man, that's where you were then, you poor kid. Yeah, but that knowledge has grown and increased. Mm. So any, it's a testament to your journey. Mm. Any plans on a, on future books? No, no, no time, man, no time. <laughs> <laughs> I've got Kayo on me. Kayo wants me to open a restaurant. I'm like, where the hell? Like, where did that come from? <laughs> He's like, that's karate as well. It, it all applies. Uh, Gary, um, before b b before I let you go, um, I wanted you to just talk about mindset. 
because I was listening to one of your morning talks. Um, and uh, for those that I know, uh, I, I really like uh, some of the, the, the way that Gary talks. He's, he's a Londoner and he gets to it. You know, when he talks about, okay, you want to, you want to, you want to lose weight, then you've got to be like this. You want to get strong, you've got to do this. And it's very simple and it's easy to understand. So in, in the talk earlier on today, he was talking about mindset and the importance of mindset during this current time that we're in. Okay. Some of us are in isolation. Some of us are, are doing social distancing. There are a few of us that, uh, that are on their own. They're in a small apartment. They don't have a garden and things like that. And they don't have, they don't have, the, the, the mindset starts to change. Um, and one of the things that we kind of alluded to in the conversation was the power of training. It doesn't have to be martial arts. It could be martial arts. It could be CrossFit. It could be weights. The power of that to, to, to look at the situation, accept it, and then make something of it. Um, and you, you read it very, really well. So just to finish off, is that something, you, can you talk about that and the power of that and then how right now we can use that or any methods to change our perception of how things are and mm -hmm. what you would, what you say to your, you know, the people that you train and things like that. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's no two ways about it. The, the current situation sucks from all angles. You know, you've got people get sick, people dying. And then if you're not affected by that, you're in lockdown and you're restricted on what you can do. So I don't know what side you look at. It's kind of negative. Now, the temptation is to get stuck in a cycle of what I call the pity pit. You get stuck in it and you can't, you can't find your way out because no one knows when this is going to finish, right? There's, like, there's no end date in sight. So then that can lead to a feeling of helplessness. Helplessness gives in to, to, to despair. Yeah. And once you have that, then, you know, then you're just looking at it when you're basically you're counting out, counting down days to fucking death, man. Achieving nothing, right? Yeah. Now, I'm pretty sure all of us had dreams as kids, as grown-ups. You're stuck in a job you don't want to do. I wish I could do something else. I wish I could retrain. I wish I could upskill. I wish I could create, write a book, fucking do a podcast, whatever it's going to be. We all have these dreams, but we can never do them because we don't have the time because you're out here busy trying to earn a living or whatever it's going to be. Well, we're all in the same situation now. Most of us have just been given the best blessing we could have ever been handed. You've been given a golden ticket of time. One thing you can't buy is more time. You've just been given it. For those of us who are at home working from home and stuff, still getting paid. You're getting paid and you've got time on your hands. Your biggest excuse has just been removed. Now, what are you going to do with it? You either look back on this time and you see it at the time you spent sat on your ass watching Netflix, eating Doritos, laughing at the Tiger King. You know, that's cool. Ultimately, it's not going to progress you in life. Or you look back on this time as the moment your life changed. When all of a sudden, all the cards fell in the right place, you had the time to do that course you said you were going to do, to lose the weight you said you were going to lose, but you never did. But now you've got a chance, man. The excuse has been removed for you. So it's either a blessing or a curse, depends on what way you look at it, right? Yeah. Fantastic. Well, with those wise and closing words, Gary, thank you for your time. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. I'm definitely going to come and visit you and, and train with you. Um, yeah, man, it was good. Up to two, yeah. I'll join you for that, Nish, when, uh, when the time's right. It's been yeah, it's great. Great. I found it really interesting. And um, I'm sure it, everyone listening did as well. Those that had a, a, an interest in karate, especially. But um just generally it's been... yeah so many so many close similarities with 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 many stuff i wasn't aware of until you shared them and i'm sure there's more that's going to come out so gary before before we close off um how can people find you uh, how can they connect with you uh, instagram facebook yeah. <coughs> instagram facebook um you know they can follow the pc farm on instagram or my own personal one my own personal one's a bit mad there's weird stuff on that when when you get a chance, uh, you're part of the group, mate. 
put your links down there please share them with people pt farm your instagram feel free to do it or if you want me to do it send me the links and i'll post them whatever i want people to have to connect with you and and continue um uh continue learning from you i i, I get a lot of i get a lot from your your instagram posts um they make me laugh they make my <laughs> very good <laughs> they're really good uh, and a lot from 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 the stuff that you're doing now and the stuff that you've done previously so if i'm getting it this is why i wanted you on 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 today's on today's call because i really think you can give back to this community uh, this you know your own community but to the mantis guys as well so again uh, you know thank you very much gal yeah, thank much you. appreciate cheers guy appreciate it man yeah nice. take care people take care Thank <laughs> you.